recording this video, um, how when I go to a conference, when I determine whether or not the conference was successful or whether I enjoyed the conference or whether I took anything from the conference, it usually has a blend of of a couple things. I mean, there there are some there are some times when I go I leave a conference and I'm underwhelmed, and usually that's because it's it's far too general and philosophical. Um, when the when the conference is general, talking talking sort of about teaching philosophies or these these very uh, high in the sky ideas down the road, uh, they do they do get my imagination going, obviously. But ultimately, we're talking about something that if I start today, might pop up in the classroom, maybe in five years, maybe in ten, and certainly not any faster than than history will allow it. It's not like my going to that conference is going to um, accelerate movement toward toward that. Okay, um, and and then it if if it's if the the vocabulary, the language of what's being talking talk about at the at the conference, particularly when I was younger was too far beyond what I was, what I was able to understand. Uh, again, I would, I would kind of be at a loss. Like I was sort of amazed by what they were talking about, but it was not immediately clear how it connected. Um, so then, then the other, the other problem would be is if it's on the, so at the far other end, uh, this is, this happens a lot less, but if you go to a, a specific conference about maybe a specific, very specific, uh, teaching, you know, maybe it's a tech conference or, you know, a, a project-based learning conference, it can get too too prescriptive. I mean, it can get to the point where it's almost a packet or a worksheet, and they're just saying, like, in order to do this correctly, you fill this out, uh, or you follow these exact steps to do it. And again, the problem with that is uh, that is that is a way to sort of per perpetuate the past. It's a way to make everything one size fits all. Uh, and again, it, it's something that we, we kind of don't want our students to do. Uh, just to kind of follow the follow the directions and just kind of like do this exactly exact thing and then you and then you're the same as everyone else. What we want them to do uh, is to learn critical thinking and question and creativity. Uh, and so, so what we're trying to do here, everybody, is is to kind of fit nicely in the middle. And in earlier videos and and uh, earlier sessions, maybe in in the in the conference, you have. Heard some philosophical stuff, particularly regarding formative assessment, online assessment, uh, maybe difference between formative and summative assessment, but but not quite yet. Um, the the sort of practical application, what does that look like for us when we get back to school in the fall, however that looks. And I think particularly this year, there there's a a big time stress for for teachers, particularly Catholic school teachers, about the online aspect here like what you know how how do how does what i do make sense online um and there's there's significant anxiety about that okay so you're in the right place because by by look by watching videos like this and by doing the pd that you're doing now what you're going to create is a, a foundation a structure a confidence for when when you go back um it's not you're not going to have a year-long plan because the school doesn't have a year long plan, but you are gonna have a plan for the first month. Uh, you are gonna know what you think about formative assessment, summative assessment, and you are gonna have a couple practical applications about how to get these things online, some quick wins. All right, so um, when you get, when you when you watch this video, you can get, get I'm gonna give you a few uh, sort of practical formative assessments uh, that you can use online um, in an online environment that will get that will get very good reactions from the students and also uh, get get them demonstrating the standards and, and kind of course objectives that we feel like we might be losing when we lose that that face to face. Okay, um, and I, I should say too, like, well, let me give you an ex let me give you an example of, of someone two types of learning that actually happen in, in real life. So like riding a bike. Okay, riding a bike is something that is a completely formative process. It is a completely formative process. You are given you are given formative assessment by your parent or legal guardian who's teaching you to ride the bike. Uh, they will hold on to the bike a little bit maybe in the beginning and then and then like slowly they'll let go of it for a couple seconds and then they always do like my dad did the trick where like he was holding the bike and I'm like dad are you holding it you're holding it and he's like yeah I'm holding it. And I had ridden the I had ridden the bike for like a hundred yards and didn't quite realize that he was just walking next to me. He hadn't even put the hand on there. Okay, so this is a, this is a very formative process. And then and then there's kind of the idea of like everybody falls off the bike, you fall off the bike, 
And it's not about, did you fall off the bike? It's about, are you going to get back on the bike? So you get back on the bike and now you've won, right? Like you've learned how to, you've learned how to ride the bike. You've learned how to overcome this difficulty. And that's like really learning. You, we, we, then, then there's this term, like this, this idiom, it's like riding a bike. And that means at least in America, that means like, if something's like riding a bike, it means once you've learned it, you've learned it and you can do that forever. Uh, my wife's a horrible bike rider. She hasn't read, ridden a bike since she was a little kid. But if we're on vacation, there's a bike. She gets on the bike. She's on a red bike. She doesn't have to relearn to ride the bike. Okay, because she's, she's gone through the process of learning to ride the bike. And now she can demonstrate that skill whenever for the rest of her life. All right. So to me, to me, that is like pure learning right there. There's no summative assessment. There's no, um, okay, now that you've learned to ride the bike, you have this one, you know, 60 minute period that starts now and ends in 60 minutes where you will show people that you can ride your bike and if you do it then you do it, you've done it forever and if you don't do it then you never knew how to do it and and to me that's that is an obfuscation of of what we're trying to do and it's it's kind of like i think the reason that students get so bogged down with school is replacing the motivation for learning it's kind of like uh you hear about these athletes, you know, that, that get paid all this money and all of a sudden this job that they wanted to do, like become a baseball player, become a hockey player, basketball player, soccer player, all of a sudden the, the reasons that they got into it, the love of the sport, maybe the, even the love of a particular team that they're on or, or, or um, a city or something like that, it, it just gets conflated with money. Like how much money am I getting? Okay. Oh, this guy, this, they're going to pay me more. That's more respect. That's more appreciation. I'm going to that place. And all of a sudden, the reason that you are doing this is for money, as opposed to when when money wasn't even on the table, the reason that you're doing it was because you really like to play that sport and you really wanted to get better at it. And you had this kind of intrinsic motivation. I don't think anybody ever picks up, say, a basketball. And the reason that they do that is because they're like, I'm going to this. This is going to be my I'm going to make money on this. I'm going to make a million dollars. Now, maybe it becomes that pretty quickly. I don't know. That wasn't my circumstance, but. I, I do know in general, when you pick up an activity that you like, you're doing that because you like it uh, with no, no real feeling that you're going to become a millionaire for that. If you ever become a millionaire for that, you know, the studies would show that the, the motivation now is replaced and you are now doing this as a job. And if the money is now taken away, you stop liking that thing. Okay. So for me, like traditional grades work that way in that when, before, when you get to, you know, between kindergarten and third grade, it's really pure learning that's happening. And then after third grade, things start to get competitive because you have to start competing to get into high schools. And then now all of a sudden you've got percentage points and those percentage points become the reason that you're doing something. And so the summative assessment, we sort of pounded into our students that the summative assessment is the thing. The ACT is the thing. This essay is the thing. You're learning to write essays to learn to write essays so that you can do better at school, so that you can eventually do more school, so that eventually you can stop doing school and never write another essay, okay? And to, to the student, I mean, that says once, you know, like once I've written an essay, I've written an essay, and, and now it's a hoop that I have to jump through, okay? So the reason I bring this up is just because um, I don't philosophically really agree with uh, traditional traditional alphanumeric grading system i don't really agree with grades as we do it um i'm i am much more, much more of a standards based or competency based person however uh and and the the good thing about about this video here is i teach in a school that my philosophy doesn't match with the reality um and you probably do too okay so even if you if you really deeply believe that it doesn't change the fact that you have to give a grade your kids want your students want a grade and their parents want a grade and your your administration is demanding that you give them a grade so whether you want to give them a grade or whether you think that that's not learning or whatever it doesn't really matter because you have to do that because it's part of the job and so again with this video I'm keeping that in mind and I really want to try to make sure that what we're doing is synthesizing our reality with kind of our um oh I don't know like like our ambition down the road or, or even our philosophy with our reality because there are ways to to sort of get those both in there okay so let's move to the 
Samer model here. Now, this is, I've always called this Samer. I don't know. Some people might call it SM, SAMR, but I've, I've heard it Samer. Um, and to, Samer is something, now there, there's a good video that ABLI has produced. So if you have not watched the Samer video, you should watch the Samer video just to get a little background on this. But I think I think a lot of what, um, I think the, the hesitancy around the online learning is is in this model here, okay? Because when we start implementing tech in our face-to-face -face classrooms, SAMR is a pretty good way to make sure that you're doing it correctly. But the problem is, usually speaking, um, we are so ingrained with our face-to-face -face stuff. Uh, we, we so fiercely defend the face-to-face -face atmosphere uh, that that's real learning happening. Um, and as teachers, of course, I mean, the face-to-face the learning is where we have the most power. I mean, the face-to-face -face learning is where we have the most absolute to the second control over everything that's happening. This kid needs to stop talking. You need to put your phone away. You need to listen. You need to shut up. You need to move over here. Like, these are the things that we can do face-to-face. -face. And so we did, like, as teachers, we all did well at face-to-face, -face, probably. I doubt any of you were bad face-to-face -face learners or bad in a traditional classroom. And if you, if you were, uh, as you have gotten older and now have become a teacher, you're probably fiercely defensive of it. You, 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 it's like, I've learned from my ways and now I, now I realize uh, my, my fault here. Um, and so even the implementation of technology in the classroom was something that was, that was it, at least we, I think my school was a pretty early forward. I mean, we've been doing this for 15 years with a one-to-one -one classroom. And I mean, it took seven years, eight years, maybe 10 before every teacher in the school was like, Okay, I see now that there's no way this is going away. You know, that's where we, that it took us a decade for teachers to even get to the point where they're like, "All right, I'm willing to accept the fact that I have to use this, whether I want to or not." First five years, teachers were telling students, "Put it away, put the put the computer away, use the notebook in my class." Uh, and so, with if this is the model by which you you start to implement technology, I would I would suggest. That probably, even if you've done this pretty well, if you're if you're an all face-to-face -face school, which mine is, I doubt, I heavily doubt, that even if you're a pretty tech-savvy teacher, most people don't even ever go past augmentation because they don't have to, because it's only enhancing the lecture that they're giving. Okay, if substitution is kind of gimmicky, augmentation is at least something where you can say, okay, this is doing something that I already do better, okay? Now, the real uncharted territory, the brave new world of, of blended or all online or remote learning was the fact that even if you were here, even if you were on augmentation, COVID-19 hits, everybody goes home, and whether you like it or not, we are now in transformation, okay? Everything is different. That thing that you felt so comfortable with the in class the face to face model it's gone it is gone everything's transformed and if you had not progressed up the same or ladder all of your assessments all of your practices are either substitution or augmentation with regard to tech learning now everything has been thrust into an into the transformation and everything needs to be modified or redefined at least as far as online is concerned Okay, so if you never even got onto this this model here with your tech, probably you found yourself shoehorning everything you did into a Zoom meeting, right? Like the teachers at my school that complained about it right away, and they said, you know, like, what do I do now? Everything I've done doesn't, like, I can't do this at home, so what I'm going to do is we're going to have a Zoom meeting, and I'm going to do my exact lecture that I would have done, and... I'm going to tell people to be quiet and tell people to raise their hand. Uh, and we're going to, I'm going to give participation points based on whether this guy talks. And, you know, if this guy, if you think this guy's cheating, then he's going to get a zero, right? Like they, they are trying to take the face-to-face -face stuff and they're trying to just, again, jam it or shoehorn it into this uh, tech, you know, all tech remote learning. Now, if you are, if you were on this, this meter at all, if you're on this model, this ladder, I would call it at all, then you know you feel some dissonance as the tech that you were using was was largely to enhance an in-class 
activity. Maybe you used the tech for homework. Maybe you used uh, the tech for 